All right. Welcome to this installment of the Young Scientist webinar series. Uh, this evening, we're going to be hearing from Lisa Hildebrand, and she's going to be talking about investigating the fine scale foraging ecology of gray whales in Port Orford, Oregon. And she tweaked the title a little bit, so you'll get the updated title as soon as she brings her presentation on. And then our next uh, installment for this series is going to be on Tuesday, March 9th, and we're going to be hearing from Toby Harrison, um, Harbison, um, about uh, you are what you eat, understanding the relationship between commercial fishing and the feeding ecology of Dungeness crabs using isotopic and gut content analysis. And a little bit about uh, the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Boyes, and I am the communications coordinator for the collaborative and it's an honor to coordinate this series. And the Cape Perpetual Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And how we do that is we have three guiding principles and they are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. Um, and we have a variety of founding partners, as you can see at the bottom here, uh, some federal agencies, state agencies, local nonprofits, as well as the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Laura, Umpqua, and Sayuslaw Indians. And our focus is on the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, and it's or uh, the largest marine reserve of five in Oregon. And in addition with the marine reserve and the prote marine protected areas to the north and south, there's some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. Um, so that's kind of our range that we work within. And I always like to give a fun fact. And this time, this week, I wanted to give a big shout out to our amazing volunteers. Um, you'll see on the next slide that we have a variety of community science projects, and we could not do it without our volunteers. Um, we've had over 85 volunteers and uh, helping out with over 300 hours of service and giving their time um, over the last couple years. And I just am so grateful to them. And it's really a lot of fun getting to work alongside of them and get to know them. And if you're interested in getting involved in volunteering with a collaborative, here's a variety of projects that we work with and coordinate with our partners. Um, some of them are seasonal and some of them are monthly. Um, you can find all of these events um, on our calendar, uh, events calendar at our website at kperpetualcollaborative.org. Um, and we'll post everything there as soon as it's uh, ready to go live. And we also are hosting a Cape Perpetual Winter Speaker Series on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, through March. And you'll also find a listing of upcoming presentations there as well. And I always like to encourage you um, to connect with us on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Uh, this recording, as well as our other presentations, uh, have, will be recorded and have been recorded, and that's where they're available, is on our website, on our blog, and our YouTube channel, so you can share them or re uh, go back and listen to them. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Lisa Hildebrand. She is a third year graduate student at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife under the supervision of Dr. Lee Torres in her Geospatial Ecology of Marine Megafauna Lab. She's an international student from Germany who very quickly after moving here in the fall of 2018 fell in love with Oregon and all it has to offer. Doesn't take long, does it? <laughs> Lisa has undertaken research on a handful of marine mammal species, including bottlenose dolphins and harbor seals, humpback, blue, and now gray whales who have become the focus of her graduate research. And with that, Lisa, I will let you pull up your screen. Um, and as Lisa's pulling it up, I just wanna let you know that we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And so if you have questions that come about um, as Lisa's speaking, feel free to add them to the Q&A box uh, or the chat box, and we will get to those uh, at the end. And with that, Lisa, it is all yours. Great. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thanks so much. And can you see my screen? All good? Yep, looks great. Awesome. Thanks for that introduction. Um, thanks for inviting me to be um, a part of your Young Scientist Speaker Series. I'm really excited to be here. 
um, and share my talk, which is titled um, A Small Piece of a, of a Large Puzzle, Investigating the Prey Quality and Foraging Choices of Gray Whales Along the Oregon Coast. So it has changed just a tiny bit, but it's still about the same general topic as the last title. So um, as my talk title alludes to, there is a puzzle that is involved with these gray whales um, that I've researched for my master's um, for my master's thesis, which is the research that I'm going to be presenting on today. But before we can get to that puzzle, um, let's first talk a little more generally about gray whales, which currently exist in two populations. There's the Western North Pacific population, which occurs um, along the Russian coastline and is relatively small. It only contains about 150 individuals. And then there's the Eastern North Pacific population, which is much larger and um, is distributed along the Eastern North Pacific um, coastline. Historically, there used to be a North Atlantic population as well. However, unfortunately, due to historic whaling, this population um, no longer exists. So for the purposes of this talk and my research, um, we are interested in the Eastern North Pacific or the ENP gray whales. And this population migrates annually from their breeding grounds in Baja, California, Mexico to their summer feeding grounds in the Arctic in the Bering, Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. And once up there, the ENP gray whales predominantly feed benthically on amphipods. So unlike other baleen whales, which typically filter water to obtain their prey, these ENP gray whales will actually take up mouthfuls of sediment and mud and filter that in order to obtain their amphipod prey. And this ENP population is estimated to contain about 25,000 individuals, so it's quite a large population, but unfortunately they've experienced two unusual mortality events in the last 20 years. And an unusual mortality event occurs when the stranding rates of a, a marine mammal population are above the average stranding rates that are normally seen from year to year. And there's a few hypotheses as to why um, this population has undergone two of these events in the last two decades. One of which is that this population may have just reached carrying capacity, which simply means that the environment in the Arctic is unable to sustain and support such a large population. And the second theory is kind of tied to the first one in that environmental shifts in the Arctic due to climate change have affected and changed the prey populations in such a way that they're not able to keep up their production to support this uh, large amount of gray whales. However, there is a little subgroup of the ENP, which is called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, which contains about 250 individuals. And this group cuts their migration short and, um, and they don't go all the way to the Arctic. Instead, they spend their summer foraging seasons along the Pacific Northwest coastline from Northern California to Southern British Columbia. And within this range, they um, feed in very shallow nearshore habitats. And they don't just feed on these benthic amphipods that the ENP gray whales in the Arctic feed on, but rather they have um, quite a broad diet feeding on a number of different um, prey species and using a range of different feeding behaviors to prey upon them. And so this is when we start talking about this puzzle of why the PCFG even exists. Well, if we just look at this map, I'm sure that we can all think of a really good reason, namely that these whales only have to migrate about half the distance to get to their feeding grounds. So this much shorter migration probably saves the PCFG whales quite a bit of energy rather than having to migrate all the way up to the Arctic. However, then why is the PCFG group size so small? If the migration saves so much energy, why don't more whales do this? And it's especially puzzling that the PCFG is such a small group since work done by a former lab mate of mine, Dr. Leila Lemos, has proven that PCFG gray whales successfully gain weight during the summer feeding season along the Oregon coast. So what Leila did for her PhD was that she took these still images um, from drone footage to look at how the body condition of PCFG gray whales changed over the course of the foraging season over three different years. And as you can see, the whales are at their fattest at the end of um, the foraging season in October after they have progressively gained weight throughout the foraging season. And this weight gain is really important since these whales have to gain all the mass they are going to need for the subsequent year in order to undertake another migration and possibly reproduce in this short summer foraging season. 
And speaking of reproduction, another reason why it's quite surprising that the PCFG is so small is that we know that female gray whales that repeatedly use the PCFG range as their summer feeding season have successfully reproduced and supported calves. Take this famous gray whale here, for example. She's known by many as Scarback, although in the gem lab, we like to call her Scarlet, since we think Scarback is a bit too ugly of a name for such a resilient and amazing whale. Scarlet, as you can see, sustained a massive injury to her back, which has left her with a permanent concave wound. However, despite this, Scarlet has persevered, and in the last five years that we've been conducting research on the Oregon coast, the Gem Lab has seen her with two different calves, one of which is pictured here. So um, this head belongs to Scarlet, and then this little head on top of her is um, her Scarlet, uh, her calf Rose, uh, who uh, we saw her with just last summer. So given that gray whales are able to gain critical mass on the PCFG foraging ground and females successfully reproduce and support calves, why is the PCFG group so small? Why don't more whales do this? And that's what takes us to our puzzle and what brings us to our center puzzle piece. And at the center, we really have these two questions, why the PCFG exists in the first place and why, they're, uh, why they have such a small group size. Well, the decreased cost of migrating half as far to the PCFG range is probably a large reason for the existence of this group. However, there may be increased foraging costs associated with feeding in the PCFG range, and therefore this could be why the group is so small. It may also have to do have something to do with differences in prey between the Arctic and the PCFG range, differences that could relate to quantity, quality, and availability that make it worth it for whales to migrate all the way to the Arctic. So most likely the quality, availability, and quantity of prey in the Arctic is much higher than of that in the PCFG range. It could also um, have something to do with larger environmental drivers. So potentially um, the climate change in the Arctic is affecting things so much that more whales um, are deciding to go into the PCFG range. It could also just be a culturally transmitted behavior that only a certain group of whales are familiar with this range and that those females will pass this learned behavior onto their calves. Or it could potentially also have something to do with the increased risk of foraging in the PCFG range. Since the whales occupy really shallow nearshore habitats here, there's huge overlap between where they feed and where um, us humans recreate and fish a lot. Whereas in the Arctic, which is quite remote and isolated, there isn't as much overlap between um, boating and fishing traffic. So for, um, so as you can see in this puzzle, all of these pieces have question marks and that's because most of them, if not all of them, don't have a concrete answer yet, but they're all viable options as to why the PCFG is so small and why it exists in the first place. So for the first um, chapter of my master's work, I wanted to, to get at this prey quality question. I wanted to see um, whether it's true that Arctic prey has a higher quality and therefore um, it kind of explains why there's so many more whales that go to the Arctic feeding grounds rather than um, feed in the PCFG um, uh, range. And so to test this hypothesis, um, I first had to assess the quality um, through the caloric content of different zooplankton prey on the Oregon coast. And I then compared the quality of that Oregon prey as a proxy for PCFG prey to prey that's available to um, whales in the Arctic um, where they feed benthically on amphipods. So to do this, I first had to collect prey samples and I did this using something called a light trap, which really is just a modified water jug with two floats attached to the back and it's held down by a cinder block anchor, which you can see here. And we would deploy this light trap um, with the anchor keeping it anchored to the seafloor and the floats would allow the light trap to sit about a meter above the seafloor. And it might be kind of small, but you can see this little green light over here. We'd put this light into um, the light trap and that would attract zooplankton prey into the trap. We'd let it soak overnight and then the next day we'd come collect it. And as you can see, this light trap is full of tiny little zooplankton prey. So the prey sample collection for my study occurred as part of a larger study um, that's going on in the GEM lab, which investigates the physiology and ecology of PCFG whales. And so these light traps were deployed in locations where our field teams um, observed prolonged periods of whale foraging in Newport and Port Orford, Oregon. 
So once all of the prey samples made it back to me in the lab and I'd sorted them into species levels, I had to do something called bomb calorimetry, which sounds quite threatening, though it isn't to humans, although it is um, to the poor little zooplankton. Um, but what bomb calorimetry allows you to do is to figure out the caloric content of something, which really just means the amount of energy contained within a prey item. So to do this, I first had to dry out all these little critters in a desiccating oven. They were then ground into a fine powder, which was um, formed into a tiny little pellet. I then started um, building the bomb, and that really is the official term. It's not one that I've come up with. And the pellet was placed into a cradle inside the, inside the bomb. It was then, all the component parts were then screwed together and filled with oxygen. The bomb was then placed inside a calorimeter, which ran for 15 minutes. And the calorimeter would shoot um, electricity through a coiled wire, which would combust the sample. And the calorimeter would measure the difference um, in temperature, which would then spit out a caloric value of each prey item. So in our light traps, we found six predominant organ prey species. We saw two different species of amphipods, two kinds of mysotrim, and we were also able to opportunistically collect two um, species of crab larvae, um, which we saw whales actively feeding on at the surface. And we used these six prey um, species in Oregon as a proxy for prey found in the entire PCFG range due to the similarity of both prey species and habitat types that are found throughout the PCFG range from Northern California to um, Southern British Columbia. And then for our Arctic prey um, comparison, we used caloric values that were published in the literature for this amphipod species, Ampelisca macrocephala, which comprises over 70% of the benthic prey community in the Bering and Chukchi seas, and it is also the documented primary prey of ENP gray whales. So thinking about the organ prey first, what did we find? Were there caloric differences between the species? So what you see here on the x-axis, we have the six species that I just described to you, our two amphipods, the two mysid shrimp in the middle, and then crab larvae on the right side here. And on the y-axis, we have caloric content, so just the amount of energy in kilojoules per gram. And what I found was that, yes, there are caloric um, content differences between the species. And these differences were mostly driven by the fact that these two species, this mysid shrimp Neomyces rei and Dungeness crab megalope had significantly higher caloric contents than all other prey species that I tested. So now that you know um, a little bit about what's going on with Oregon prey, which I used as a proxy for the PCFG prey, let's see how they compare to Arctic amphipod prey. And to be honest with you, I was quite shocked when I made these comparisons because the two species in my study that had the highest caloric contents also had higher caloric contents than the predominant amphipod prey in the Arctic, which is the one shown in orange down here. And this was shocking to me because if you can remember the puzzle piece I was investigating for the study, I had originally hypothesized that prey quality in the PCFG range must be lower than the prey quality in the Arctic in order to explain why so many more whales forage in the Arctic than they do in the PCFG range. So to look at this a little further, um, I extrapolated these prey caloric values to daily gray whale energetic needs. And I have to thank um, a fellow grad student of mine, Selena Agbayani, who's at UBC since she did all of the um, gray whale energetic modeling here. Um, but what you can see here on these plots is age of gray whale in years on the x-axis split out by three reproductive stages. So we have lactating females on the left, pregnant females in the middle, and all others um, on the right side. And others meaning non-reproductive females and um, all males of any reproductive age. And on the y-axis, we have metric tons of prey per day that a gray whale would need to consume in order to meet their daily energetic requirements. And the different colored lines represent the different prey species. To make this plot a little easier to understand, I'm just going to highlight the three most interesting prey species here, where we have Dungeness crab in orange, uh, the Neomyces rei shrimp in pink, and then the Arctic amphipod in black. 
And so if we look at this plot, we see that if a 30 year old lactating whale could eat just Dungeness crab larvae all summer long, it would need less than half the amount of food than a whale that fed on the predominant Arctic benthic amphipods in the Arctic. Therefore, the foraging energetic cost of capture for a whale feeding on those Arctic amphipods, this black line, would be twice as high as if it fed on Dungeness crab megalope here in Oregon. So then why, if these Dungeness crabs are such caloric gold mines, why don't more whales spend their summers in the PCFG range to feed here instead? Well, I have to admit to you that this plot is a little misleading, and that's because crab larvae isn't available all year, uh, all summer long along the Oregon coast. And this is due to the pulse reproduction of Dungeness crab. Um, so they're only available for two months um, at the start of the summer and they're not available continuously. So a whale couldn't actually feed on crab larvae all summer long. However, a whale would still need to eat fewer mycid um, of Neomyces rei than Arctic amphipods per day to meet those daily energetic requirements. So why do we see this trend when clearly there are prey species available in the PCFG range that are more energetically rich than the Arctic prey? Why do we have this mismatch in prey quality and gray whale population sizes in the Arctic and in the PCFG range? And to be honest with you, the answer is we don't really know at this point, but my study has shown that prey quality is not higher in the Arctic than in the PCFG range, so prey quality cannot be the reason for the small PCFG size. What I can hypothesize is that it's likely a question of prey availability and prey quantity. Most likely, prey is more consistently available and in larger quantities in the Arctic than in the PCFG range. And coupled with this, foraging on these diverse prey species in the PCFG range may cost more energetically for the PCFG gray whales than those whales that feed benthically in the Arctic, since that's a foraging tactic that gray whales have evolved and developed for over centuries. And as you can see, there's still a lot of missing unanswered puzzle pieces here, some of which I'm hoping to address for my PhD, which I'm working on now. But for now, here is what we've learned from my first master's chapter. The caloric value of some PCFG prey is higher than the predominant ENP prey in the Arctic. However, the highest caloric prey species is not continuously available. The quantity, availability, and cost of capture of prey may be a stronger driver of why the ENP population size is so much larger than the PCFG group. And now that we know that there are significant differences in the caloric content of Oregon prey, I was curious to know whether this affected how and where PCFG gray whales foraged. Do whales select for the higher quality prey or are they not selective about quality and are they just going for quantity instead? Do they just want a lot of prey? And these questions are what led me and us um, to the second chapter of my master's, which um, aimed to examine the foraging decisions of PCFG gray whales relative to available prey quantity in terms of abundance and quality in terms of caloric content. So this study was conduct conducted out of Port Orford where uh, we have a field team every summer that is based out of OSU's field station down there. And what you see here is a, a map of our study area. Um, the black line um, is, uh, represents the shoreline and the black dot here um, shows you the cliff site, which you can see in this photo here. And on the cliff site, we would have two team members every day who would set up um, uh, set up for the day and be ready to track gray whales from shore that came into the study area. And then as the, at the same time as the cliff team was um, up tracking whales and looking for whales, we had a research kayak that went out to two um, different sampling sites, one in red here, Mill Rocks, and the other in purple here called Titchener Cove. And the blue numbers that you see are uh, kayak sampling stations. So there were six in Titchener Cove and six in Mill Rocks. So how did we collect our whale data from a cliff? Well, the cliff team uses something called a theodolite, which is a surveyor's tool that uses a known height, location, and angles to calculate a precise GPS location using Pythagoras' theorem. 
And thankfully, I didn't have to try and remember any of my middle school math because I wouldn't have remembered it. Um, but instead, we have a computer program that's able to do all of this um, calculating for us. So what you see here is a basic map of a track line of a whale from the theodolite. So um, what you can see, each of these yellow dots represents where the whale came up to, to the surface to breathe and where we were able to fix its precise GPS location. And these dots are then just simply connected by this red line. So just by looking at this very basic track, you can probably see that the whale changes the way it uses and moves within space and time. When we first started tracking the whale over here, there's a big cluster of points, which indicates that the whale spent a lot of time in this small area. It then traveled relatively quickly to this next cluster of points where it once again spent quite a lot of time and so on and so forth. So for the purpose of my study here, I wanted to know what behavior state a whale was in at each specific point location. I wanted to know whether a whale was foraging or searching or transiting. And so how did I do this? How do we assign behavior states to points in a whale track line? Well, we used something called, uh, we used a method called residence in space and time, which assigns behavior state based on occupancy patterns in space and time within a given radius. So if you look at this graphic, following this method, a whale that is transiting or traveling through um, an area will spend very little time in a radius as it just moves through it really quickly. It's going somewhere else. A searching whale, on the other hand, will spend a lot of time, but also a lot of distance uh, within a radius as it moves through an area looking for prey to consume. Then once a whale finds what it's looking for and starts to forage in an area, it's going to spend a lot of time there, but it's not gonna move a whole lot because it wants to make sure that it's eating all of that yummy, delicious prey that it's just found in that spot. So now um, that I've collected all the whale data and I've explained to you how we process that a little bit, how do we collect our prey data from a kayak? And to best show this to you, I'm going to play um, a little video of one of my ex-interns, Haley Kent, as she samples. So I hope this video doesn't come out too choppy for all of you. But here we have Haley as she first drops a Secchi disc, um, which is this disc right here, which we use to measure um, water clarity. Next up is a GoPro stick, which is an aluminum stick with a weight on the bottom that has a GoPro and a time depth recorder, which we use to assess relative prey abundance, so how much prey there is. And finally, Haley is dropping a zooplankton net, which we use to obtain a representative sample of the prey community at each station. So how do we quantify relative prey abundance, so how much prey is in an area, from a GoPro video? Well, what I did was extracted screenshots every five seconds from the pull up of the GoPro, which was done at a constant speed. These screenshots were then divided in a three by three cell grid, and I assigned a score from zero to five, zero meaning there was no zooplankton and five meaning there was the highest amounts of zooplankton to each of these boxes. And I then took the average of all of these boxes and had just one score for each screenshot. Once I'd done this for all the screenshots in one GoPro video, I summed all of these together to get one relative prey abundance value per station per day. And using these, I was then able to create a spatial layer um, of how much prey there was within my two sites with uh, lighter colors indicating lower prey abundances and darker colors indicating higher prey abundances. These spatial methods are a little more complicated and if anyone's interested, I can um, discuss those later, but um, since I don't wanna take up too much of my time, I'm just gonna keep it at that. <laughs> um, then with our net samples, um, in order to assess the prey community, so what kinds of prey um, were at each sampling station, I sorted these samples um, by species level. And what we found was three predominant species accounted for over 95% of all individual prey items identified. And these names or these pictures may maybe look a little familiar to you. And that's because um, this is one of our amphipod and both of our mysid shrimp species um, that I had identified the caloric content for in my previous chapter. 
And if you can't remember any of my findings from the previous chapter, that's totally okay. But um, something to remember going forward is that this mysid shrimp, Neomyces rei, is the one that had a significantly higher caloric value, so it has much more energy than these other two species. Just remember that going forward, it'll be um, important in the next couple minutes. So then once we'd sorted um, all of these prey uh, samples to species level, we were able to calculate the proportions of each species per sample per day. And I was then able to use this community information together with the abundance information to create different spatial layers of prey abundance and prey calories. Like I said, if someone wants to know more about those methods, I'd be happy to discuss them later. But so once I had these daily prey abundance and caloric layers, I was able to overlay the whale track lines on top. And this is an example of that. So what you're seeing here is the same whale track line on one day, but over three different prey layers. On the left here, we have the abundance of all prey grouped together. So it doesn't matter what species, it's just all the prey that was there. In the middle, we have the abundance of Neomyces rei, so that's the mysid shrimp with the higher uh, caloric content. And on the right, we have the prey layer for the other mysid shrimp, Holmesimyces sculpta. And the points of this track line are color coded according to behavior, um, as you can see down here. And the prey layers range from um, light reds, which indicate low prey abundances, and dark reds, which indicate higher prey abundances. So as you can see from these plots, if we only had information about this grouped prey abundance, then we would have been relatively confused about what the whale was doing because it transits through, it travels through quite a, um, through the area with the highest prey abundances, these bright, this bright red area. However, since we have this information split out by species as well, we can see that a lot of the foraging activity is in fact happening in the area where Neomyces rei dominates the community. And since we know from my first chapter that this species has a significantly higher caloric value than the other prey species, that now this, this track line or this plot doesn't look so puzzling to us. But without this knowledge, this species specific prey knowledge, we would have been pretty confused about why the whale spent so much time in these relatively light colored areas. So moving forward, in order to answer these questions I had about whether whales have preferences for quantity or quality, I extracted the prey values at each of these whale points and then assessed whether whales selected for one over the other, quality or quantity. So the first question that I wanted to answer was whether there are differences between whale behavior and relative prey abundance and calories by individual species. I'm only gonna show you the plot for prey abundance since the caloric plot is pretty similar to the abundance plot. So what we have here are called violin plots which show the distribution of the prey values at whale locations by behavior state with uh, purple representing forage behavior, the teal is search, and the yellow is transit. And these little diamonds that you see show the median average values. So there's a couple things to take away um, here. First of all, the median abundances of Neomyces rei are lower than those of the other two prey species, which indicates that this prey species, Neomyces rei, was less available throughout the study area and the study period. Second thing to note is that whales never foraged in areas where the amphipod Attilus tridens dominated the prey community, even though they searched and traveled through these areas, which suggests that whales actively avoided foraging on the species since they had access to them, but just decided not to eat them. And thirdly, we can see that whales foraged more in areas than they searched and traveled in, for Neomyces rei. However, the same trend is not evident for Holmesimyces sculpta, where whales searched more than they foraged. And this was interesting to us because this analysis kind of hinted at the fact that whales may have a preference for some species over others. So to further get at this question, we apply generalized linear models to answer, um, to answer these questions. Um, so what you can see here is the number of whale points within a track line, again, color coded by behavioral state, against the mean available relative abundance of prey. 
And the asterisk um, that you see in the corner here indicates where um, our models were significant. And so for all prey grouped together, what we found was that whales significantly increased their foraging effort as prey availability increased, which makes sense. There was more prey, so whales forage more. But there was no change in searching or transiting behavior with increased prey availability. But when we looked at this uh, split out by the individual species, we found some pretty interesting results. For Neomyces rei, which remember is the mysid shrimp that has a significantly higher caloric content than the other two prey species, whales significantly increased their foraging as abundance um, of Neomyces rei increased, while also significantly decreasing their searching and their transiting time. So with more prey of Neomyces rei, Whales spent more time foraging and they decreased their search and their transit time. In contrast to that, for Holmesimysis sculpta, the other mysid shrimp, the only change in whale behavior is that whales significantly increase their searching behavior when sculpta abundance increases. And what this suggests is that whales aren't quite satisfied when they encounter this prey species as they continue to search rather than increasing their foraging behavior. And this finding was pretty surprising to us because surely if prey abundance increases, a whale should increase its foraging behavior too, right? I mean, more is better. Why not just eat lots of prey? But since we know that Neomyces rei is calorically richer than Holmesimysis sculpta, we wondered whether whales maybe do prioritize quality over quantity when making decisions at this very fine micro scale. So to get at this ultimate question of do whales select quality over quantity, we looked at each whale track line and asked the question, did the whale select, select areas with significantly more prey than was available in the site? And to explain to you again how I did this, I'm just gonna pull this plot back up, which is once again, the whale track line color coded by behavior laid over the top of a um, prey uh, abundance layer with light colors indicating low abundances and dark colors indicating high abundances. And what I did for this analysis is that I compared all of the values in the cells at the site to get the prey that was available to the whale. So this is all the prey that the whale could have consumed or had access to. And I then compared these values to the prey values at the whale locations where the whale actually went by behavior. And I summarized these results in percentages here. And what this analysis showed us is that foraging whales selected areas with significantly higher Neomyces rei abundance and calories 100% of the time, all the time. A similar trend occurred when prey was grouped where foraging whales selected areas with significantly higher abundance and calories I'm going to say almost 100% of the time because 80 and 90% is pretty close. However, interestingly, foraging whales only selected areas dominated by Holmesimysis sculpta about half the time um, that it was available. And what this shows is that when Neomyces rei is available, foraging whales will always select for it. But this is not the case for Holmesimysis sculpta. Now, searching whales also selected areas with significantly higher prey abundance and calories than available across the site more than half the time. And they had a higher selection rate when assessed at the species level for Neomyces rei consistently and for calories of Holmesimysis sculpta. So what the results from that second chapter mean is that PCFG whales display selection and avoidance of certain prey species based on their caloric values. Because remember, whales never foraged in the areas that were dominated by the amphipod, Attilus tridens, which had the lowest caloric value of the three prey species in this study. But they always selected to forage for Neomyces rei when it was available to to them, even if it was available at lower abundances than other prey species. Therefore, we can conclude that prey quality impacts the micro scale uh, foraging decisions of gray whales and likely of many baleen whales. And for this reason, prey quality should not be overlooked in studies of predator foraging ecology. And so for my general conclusions, let's recall the puzzle of the PCFG that I addressed at the beginning of my talk. 
There's a shorter migration that the PCFG whales have, yet there's a smaller population size. Why is this? Is it some sort of energetic trade-off with a shorter migration, but having to work harder, or is it a culturally transmitted thing? And what my research shows is that foraging um, in the PCFG uh, range does involve energetic trade-offs. Even though the PCFG whales may save energy through a shorter migration and may therefore benefit from having access to some prey that are calorically richer than prey in the Arctic, like those Dungeness crab megalope, they may have to spend much more energy finding and capturing these prey. Therefore, overall, the longer migration to the Arctic may be worth it in the end. Future studies um, invest, should investigate the energetic costs of different gray whale foraging behaviors, as well as measuring prey densities in the two regions so that um, they can help continue to fill in those puzzle pieces of that large puzzle. And so in terms of the prey and habitat selection of PCFG whales, um, this study was actually the first to investigate these very micro scale um, foraging decisions of a baleen whale um, species relative to in situ prey at the same scale. So our study is the first to be able to track a large baleen whale as well as collect prey data at the same scale at the same time. And at the scale, what we found is that quality really is an important component of prey selection by whales. And with that, I just like to say um, thank you to um, all of these funders that are listed here. And in particular, I want to shout out if there's anyone um, in the audience today who owns a gray whale license plate. Um, your funds went directly to um, the Port Orford Research Project um, and part of funding our undergraduate and high school interns. So I really want to thank um, any of you who have those. If you don't have them and are looking to spruce up your car, shameless plug to go out and buy um, the Oregon Coastal Playground license plate. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you um, for tuning in today. Oh, that was really great, Lisa. Um, it's amazing how much work goes into getting all that data. Um, I always like to kick off the questions with um, one kind of around inspiration. So what, was there an aha moment for you or what was it that you said, this is the area of research that I wanna dive deeper in? Oh, wow, <laughs> um, that's uh, a good question. Um, I think for me, it really was just when I saw, I guess, um, marine mammals in general, but especially baleen whales for the first time with my own eyes. And just, I was so triggered um, and curious about how these behemoth animals are able to survive by eating the tiniest little critters um, out there. Um, and that just kind of, I guess, got me on a, on a cascading cycle of wanting to to ask more questions about baleen whales. But yeah, I think it was really thinking about that, that idea of very large eating very tiny and why and how. <laughs> Curiosity gets the best of us, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna jump into the questions here. We've got some good ones. Um, do the microplastics in the ocean get scooped up by feeding gray whales and causing their weight loss and death lately? That is a really fantastic question and um, one that I'm partially involved in. So um, there is currently an ongoing project where we're um, some of the um, prey samples that we collected, we're actually running right now for microplastics to see if um, you know the little mice and shrimp and the amphipods are ingesting the microplastics. And we also plan on analyzing some fecal samples that we collect as part of our larger project in Newport to see if we can detect microplastics in their um, fecal samples there. It's a really good question. I'm not um, entirely sure. I would tend to say um, the, the starving of, of whales that strand, um, if it is plastic related, tends to be that they ingest kind of large macroplastics. Like I know there have been stranded um, odonocetes, so toothed whales that have um, ingested plastic bags and such, likely mm -hmm. mistaking them for squid prey. And that those kinds of um, large plastics will get bundled up in, in stomachs and the whales um, are then no longer able to ingest anything else and then they become emaciated and die. With the microplastics, I 
think it may be more of a long-term, almost nuanced issue where um, it's particularly also the toxins that may be adhering to microplastics that can then leach out into the bloodstream or into the blubber that can have maybe more long-term effects that we're not quite aware of um, yet right now. Mm -hmm. That's a good question and one that we're definitely looking into. Yeah, more learning on that probably as the years go on. Yes. What is Scarlet's, why is Scarlet's lesion orange? Is an organism colonizing on it? Yes, good question. Yes, um, so uh, it is an organism that is colonizing on it. They're called cyamids, um, which are also called whale lice. And I've, I've been very curious to know more about this, but I don't think there's, there's that much known about how the whale lice potentially affect the whale um, or whether they're relatively um, unperturbed by it. Um, but you do find it almost on any whale that has a wound that these whale lice immediately flock in. And I'm assuming that, that the whale lice have some benefit of whether they consume the blood or the flesh, I'm not quite sure, but um, Scarlet seems to be doing very well for having so many on her back in that huge wound. Um, but yes, it is, it is a type of um, colonizing organism. Yeah. Um, and let's see here. I wanted to get up to this one. Crab catch is way down this year in Oregon. Did you see a decrease in crab larva megalope? I think I pronounced that right. A couple of years ago, could gray whale feeding affect crab recruitment? Oh, good question. Um, I have never thought about whether gray whale consumption could affect crab recruitment. I have to say, unfortunately, um, the crab samples that we have definitely are very opportunistic. Um, we, we have no way of knowing where these swarms will pop up and we only scoop up a couple when we see surface swarms that gray whales are actively feeding on. So I'm not able to give a good representation of um, whether or not you know, numbers of megalope have gone up or down since we don't sample them in such a systematic way. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if, if these gray whales could make such a dent in crab larvae megalope numbers. That's a really good question. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe another extension of research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Was it difficult to identify the zooplankton to species? Oh yeah, that it is a really tricky task. <laughs> and I have to say, I should have I should have acknowledged all of my interns way more who helped me in that. So with the zooplankton, <laughs> there's a um, there's a tiny, so for the mysid shrimp, there's a tiny little structure at the end of their tails called the telson. And the tips of those structures have different spines um, in terms of their shapes and their arrangement. And that is what you have to use to identify different mycid shrimp species. Um, and it's definitely, it's tedious mm. work. It's a lot of microscope um, hours. It's a lot of trying to get them in just the right position. So my interns and I have definitely spent upwards of 200 hours just going through those samples. Um, <laughs> Yeah, listening to a lot of podcasts at the same time. <laughs> so, how do can the how do the gray whales differentiate if they can if they choose to go for one more than another? How do they tell a difference? Do we do we know? That is the million no. dollar question, <laughs> and one that I would love to know the answer to. Um, we have no idea at this point. So. Um, Vision is probably one of the weakest senses that whales have. They have really small eyes relative to the rest of their body size. Um, and probably because it, it doesn't do them much good since waters can be quite murky. A lot of whales dive quite deep. Um, mm -hmm. So it's probably, yeah, I, d I don't even know. I wonder if it's, a, a lot of marine prey is known to give off, um, I don't think it's a pheromone and I'm blanking on the name. It's dimethyl something, <laughs> but they, but birds, oh, um, marine birds are attracted to this um, as well. Um, and prey, especially when prey are being fed on, they release this 
I don't know, maybe it is a pheromone. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not quite certain, but I know that they, they do a mm -hmm. really some sort of chemical that predators can cue in on. And I'm not sure if that's what whales are able to do as well and whether these prey species would have different signatures of that chemical that whales could detect nuances. I'm really not sure. Or maybe they go around and they, and they take a mouthful and then somehow know that it's not the right one. I don't, I honestly don't know. These, a lot of these results are still very surprising to us. I would have thought that whales would just yeah. whatever they can find as long as there's enough of it. <laughs> but I was uh -huh. wrong. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do mice live in the mud or in the water column? And is there a change in time of day? Great question. Mice live in the water column. Um, we find them most predominantly on a uh, reef and especially reefs with kelp. And we think that this is partially um, a mechanism to protect themselves from predators. So mycid shrimp are fed on, um, on the Oregon coast, their two main predators are gray whales and rockfish. So I think the method of kelp protection may work somewhat well against rockfish since rockfish will target single zooplankton. Um, but I don't think they're a good match for our gray whales who just, um, take big mouthfuls and we've seen them being very acrobatic um, in reefy kelp areas. So I think the, the gray whales have figured out a way to, to overcome that. And, um, oh, the second question was whether there's a difference between night and day. That's a good question. It's something that we haven't um, investigated. Um, my guess would be probably no, because these habitats are so shallow. So gray whales, we find them in, in, in water depths anywhere from, you know, four or five meters to maybe 15, 20 meters. And so um, I think in those shallow water depths, there isn't much difference in, in the amount of light. And so you probably wouldn't get kind of that, that vertical migration that you do with more deep water species like krill that do go further mm -hmm. up and down in the water column. Mm-hmm. Um, this one says, great study design. Can you tell us about how to find out more about the high school intern program? Oh, uh, great, uh, great question. Um, so uh, send me an email. That would be probably the best way. Um, I can type my email into the chat um, or, oh, I don't know how that works. <laughs> Maybe I can't. <laughs> Maybe I can try to, to I, I'll do that too. Um, <laughs> um, but it is also currently being um, advertised on um, the MMI, so the Marine Mammal Institute, Oregon State University website um, under, I think, student opportunities. But the best way would be to get in touch with me, um, which is Lisa dot Hildebrand at oregonstate.edu. But maybe um, Tara can find a way to. Yeah, I did. I, I, pl I plugged it in the chat there um, so folks can copy it. Yes, please get in touch with me. <laughs> and then was there a correlation between whale die off of the PCF group and lower number of prey? Good question. Um, so the um, this unusual mortality event, the two that have happened, um, they um, have been associated with that larger population in the Arctic. To my knowledge, none of the PCFG whales have um, died as a result of these die-off events. Um, but it's something that we're still investigating. So not entirely sure. Um, and um, most likely the unusual mortality events were tied to something related to prey because a large proportion of those whales did strand emaciated, so quite skinny, meaning that they weren't able to get the prey that they needed. Um, but yes, none of those were officially tied to any PCFG whales. Okay, and that might lead into this question really nicely. Can you talk a little bit about how we even know there is a PF, PCFG? In other words, how do we know they are the same individuals and where they are migrating or not? Fantastic question. Um, so gray whales are um, have unique pigmentation on their bodies and on their um, on their tail flukes. 
um, that's unique to each individual. So it's kind of like a human thumbprint where no two human thumbprints are the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so by taking photos of these gray whales, um, we're able to um, discern them from their individual markings and we can re-identify them not only between months, but also between years. And this pigmentation doesn't really change that much from year to year. Um, so even over a span of 20, 30, 40 years, we're still able um, to, to recognize the same individuals. So there have been, um, the Gem Lab has only been researching these gray whales um, since 2015, but there's been some researchers up in Washington and British Columbia that have been documenting, that have, that started documenting this, this kind of subgroup since the 1990s and they have records of, of whales that they've seen since 1992 every single summer. And so from this kind of network of researchers that we have on the west coast um, and sharing information we're able to see oh so this individual we see it every year um, and we see it every month which means that it probably can't be going to the arctic mm -hmm. kind of in between that we're that we're all sharing photos and all seeing it in other locations within this range um, but i will say that there is some flexibility in in you know whether or not we see some individuals so it's not like there's a very specific 250 individuals that never go to the arctic and that we see every year i do think that for certain individuals within this PCFG group, there is some fluidity in, do I go to the PCFG range or is it better if I go to the Arctic this year? And actually that's one of the questions that I hope to address for my PhD to see if, if those kind of fluctuations in numbers that we see and where we see known versus mm -hmm. unknown individuals, whether that's tied to kind of shifts in the environment, both in the Arctic um, and here, and whether those environmental shifts could be um, kind of used as a proxy for prey availability. Nice. Yeah. Uh, what story does the poop tell? Are <laughs> whales eating these prey species? Does the species they avoid taste bad? <laughs> Fantastic question. Um, we don't uh, know yet, but um, we are um, working with another lab in the Marine Mammal Institute. The Oh, I always get this wrong, the Cetacean Conservation and Genomics Lab, CCGL. Um, and they are, um, we're working together with them to analyze our poop samples that we um, scoop up every summer um, to look at kind of that, the, the prey side of things. So to do um, some prey analysis to maybe also see if certain individuals like a prey uh, like one prey species maybe other individuals aren't so specialized and they'll eat whatever they can find but yes we're hoping that the poop can maybe give us a little bit um more specificity about this prey selection topic good question <laughs> <laughs> are you aware of any effects of climate change on the population dynamics of the most common prey species no, I am not, but I would love to know. <laughs> You're all asking all the questions that I am asking too. This is great. <laughs> um, it is something that, that I have thought about whether some of the prey species that we see would be more resilient to climate change or not. And, and I'm not sure there's no, there's no experiment done with these species in a lab setting um, or any documentation of how these nearshore um, species have changed in um, with climate change. I know that with the warm blob that happened in the Pacific um, in 2014-15, that there were a lot of studies on how offshore prey populations changed. So with the kind of explosion of pyrosomes and with krill declines and fish declines, but very little research was actually done in the nearshore which is where we find um, these gray whales and their prey. So it, I guess in retrospect, it would have been interesting to be, have been able to look at what was happening in the near shore during that time. But unfortunately there's not that much data on that. And in relation to climate change here, um, it's kind of a, another prong of it. Uh, do you notice it being at all related to impacting the migration patterns? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I do know there was a recent study um, that looked at calving rates and um, kind of timing of sea ice in the Arctic. 
And that did find that um, if sea ice retreat happened too late in the season, so if the Arctic was covered up by too much sea ice and whales didn't have as much access to prey um, areas up there, that the subsequent year there weren't as many calves. And that's probably because um, pregnant females tend to be one of the first whales to migrate up to the Arctic. And if they don't have access to food early on, whales actually have control of terminating their pregnancies. So potentially whales that don't have access to enough food early on will think that they're not gonna be able to almost catch up the amount of food that they need and then terminate a pregnancy. Um, but I'm not, so, so that study is primarily about the Arctic um, and uh, gray whale uh, calf counts that are done in California by NOAA. Um, but I'm not sure if it's actually changed the migration, I guess, pattern. Um, I think that's remained pretty, um, pretty similar for decades now. Okay. And I just want to share too that um, Don and Minda have shared a link to the Marine Mammal Institute, it looks like, internship opportunities. And I've shared it in the chat. I've shared it twice because I didn't realize it was the same link. <laughs> so extra sharing. Um, but that link is there for the, anybody who's interested in learning more about that. Um, and the next question, I wonder if prey species may make different sounds. Aren't whales very sensitive to sound? They are very sensitive to sound. It's probably their best um sense that they have um i would think i'm not an expert but that's what i, I would assume yeah. and um yeah that's a that's a good um idea um i don't know if these prey species make sound underwater i know that there's um obviously many that do um but yeah that would be interesting if the whale could clue in on different sounds that these different mm -hmm. prey species mm -hmm. potentially make that's a good idea i hadn't even thought about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> How long do gray whales live? Um, not entirely certain, but almost kind of the lengths of a, of a human life, I think. So it's estimated kind of 50, 60, maybe 70 years. So I guess a little shorter than a human life, but yeah, quite old. <laughs> and um, this, it looks like our last question. You alluded to a broad range in relation to researchers sharing photos over time and along the coast. How large is a whale range? Are our Depot Bay whales going to Newport for a dinner out to British Columbia, to Port Orford? <laughs> um, most likely, yes. So, um, when um, the Port Orford field team is doing research at the same time as the Newport team, um, I'll, I'll kind of, when I'm down in Port Orford, I'll be talking to the people in Newport and we will often have the same whales within just days of one another. So we know that there's travelers that like to kind of explore the coast and explore different prey, um, prey areas and prey patches since that's quite dynamic. That being said, we also have some whales that I see in Port Orford regularly that we've never seen before in Newport. So I do think it's, again, it's, oh. it's we have some, some individuals that like to stay in one area, um, maybe one that they're more familiar with or one that they know how to exploit and get the most prey out of and others that maybe are a little more prone to adventure and willing to <laughs> travel a little and maybe just stopping in at all the best, at all the best um, prey spots. Uh -huh. Kind of like humans. <laughs> kind of like humans, exactly. Some of us are bodies and some are more uh, roamers. <laughs> yeah. All right. And with that, that wraps our presentation and Q&A for the night. Lisa, exactly. I just want to say thank you so much again for joining us. Really great presentation. Great questions from the audience. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, those were fantastic questions. Some of the best yeah. I've ever had. <laughs> and just want to mention here, we've got a couple of uh, chats in here just saying thank you so much very insightful uh really enjoy the presentation and the research that you're doing um and best of luck to you in your phd thank you so much everybody <laughs> thanks for joining me on a monday night tuesday and with that i don't even know yeah tuesday and with that i hope you all have a really great weekend or we're not in the weekend yet i'm thinking it's saturday have a really great rest of your week um and enjoy it and hope to see you at a future presentation
Bye-bye. Have a good night.